I did not really invent this phrase about God being a mathematician. Um, this was invented actually by an astrophysicist, James Jeans, in the last century. Um, and he, he also posed it as some sort of a question. And the idea behind this question is really not so much about what God is or isn't. It is more about how come that mathematics has such powers that we can explain everything in the universe through mathematics. This is really the meaning of the question, is God a mathematician? You see, we explain phenomena here on Earth through mathematics, and we explain phenomena at the universe at large through mathematics. And when I say the universe at large, it means also in time, because when we see a galaxy that is, say, 10 billion light years away, it means we see light that left that galaxy 10 billion years ago. So, yes, the same laws, as far as we can tell, describe things everywhere and at all times. And we want to understand why, when we formulate these laws with mathematics, they work so well. Uh, there was this physicist, Eugene Wigner, uh, who got the Nobel Prize in Physics, and he wrote an article which he called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. Namely, indeed, this question, how come, you know, it works so well? And Einstein also wondered, why is it that these laws of mathematics, which he said, come out of the human mind, how come they work so well for the universe around us? Uh, in my opinion, we humans, we invent the concepts. Uh, namely, you know, when we talk about a circle, we actually invent this, con this abstract concept of a circle. Now, of course, we abstract this from something we see in nature. So we see in nature something. Uh, we see, for example, that we have two hands, two eyes, two ears, you know, and so on. And from these things that we see, we have somehow invent the abstract concept of the number two. And similarly with other such concepts, yes, uh, imaginary numbers, you know, things like that. We invent those concepts after we saw some things in nature. Uh, that's the invention part. Now, to come to the discovery part, once we invented those concepts, we suddenly discover all kinds of relations among those concepts, and those are not... We, we have no choice in the matter anymore. You see, once we invented the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, we now discover that those numbers have all kinds of properties and we discover theorems about them, you know, everything we call number theory, uh, we discover. And similarly, in, in geometry, after we have a triangle and a rectangle, and, and it, we discover all kinds of theorems that those things uh, obey. Uh, and in those, we have no choice. Those are pure discoveries. Um, to, to give you another example of imaginary numbers, an imaginary number, you know, square root of minus one. There is no such a number that if you square it, you get number minus one. But then humans, for various reasons, came up with something, some concept. They put for it the notation i, yes? And that's the thing that is square root of mind. Once that was invented, they discover all kinds of things about imaginary numbers and lots of theorems and so on. And in those, they have no choice. They, they are forced on us. So those are discoveries. This is why I say it's a very intricate combination of discoveries and inventions. Now, again, I, I'll say there are many people who believe, no, 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 no. It's all discoveries. Mathematics is somewhere there in some platonic world, you know, and so on, and we just discover the truths. 
There are others that say, no, it doesn't exist anywhere except in the, our, our brains. And we, we invent everything. I say, no, it's we invent some things, we discover the others. But this is not that I'm hedging my bets, you know, that I don't know which it is. I say that it is both. You, you, we see part of this mystery of how mathematics has the powers that it has is that not only that we have this active role of mathematics, namely, you know, Newton wants to, dis to, to describe motion and forces and so on, so for that he invents the concept of calculus. That's one way that you get new mathematics. But there are also all these things where mathematicians work on something completely abstract with no application in mind whatsoever. A theory of knots, you know, a theory of knots. They don't care about nature, nothing, just a theory of knots. And, and they develop this theory of knots as a mathematical abstraction, yes? Suddenly, tens, sometimes hundreds of years later, physicists discover that this theory of knots is very applicable to, you know, string theory, for example, the theory that we do today. Uh, biologists discover that they can do something about DNA with string theory and so on. So that's another part of this mystery that mathematicians invent something with no application in mind. Much later, it is found to have incredible applications for uh, natural things. is probably one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century. Um, his opinions about the nature of mathematics are, I believe, are similar to mine. I mean, in fact, I, of course, saw his opinions before I formulated mine. Uh, but he is one of those um, actually relatively few mathematicians that have this opinion that it, there is this combination. He actually is one of these people, for example, who contributed to this theory of knots and its application to things like string theory and so on. Um, and he also came up with this beautiful idea that if, for example, let's suppose that intelligence, instead of being in humans, was in some isolated jellyfish at the bottom of the ocean, um, would such a jellyfish have invented the natural numbers, one, two, three, four? Because, you see, this jellyfish only feels the motion of the water, the temperature of the water. There is nothing discrete there. So, you know, there was nothing to count. So maybe they would not have come up with this particular notion of one, two, three, four as we have. Uh, we have come up, I think, with one, two, three, four because our perception is such that we perceive this as one object and this is another object and this is another object. So very naturally, you know, we can see the boundaries of things. So very naturally, we, we can count them. But if everything you see is a continuum, then maybe natural numbers would not have been so natural. You know, neuroscience is, is a young science. They do experiments where they do this functional MRI where, you know, they try to determine, they put people in, in, in MRI machines and uh, they ask them various questions and they see which areas of the brain light up, become activated when they ask this. So, for example, there have been some famous experiments where they um, play a series of tones what they change is they change both the number of the tones and also the patterns of the tones. Uh, you know, like if if the tones go da 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 like this, then they can change either. So these were four tones. They can change to five tones. Let's say yes, da 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 da, or they can change also in pattern. That is goes da 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 da. Let's say. Um, and they compared uh, monkeys and humans 
and see what areas of the brain uh, light up and uh, they discover, these are of course initial experiments, and they discover that both uh, monkeys and humans can respond to a number, a small number, and they can even respond to a pattern but that when they change both the pattern and the number only humans respond in a certain part so there are some abilities that are uniquely human in that respect so now of course these are first steps it doesn't mean we already understand a lot but we start to identify at least areas in the brain that are responsible for some things